Hi, my name is Taryn and welcome to a British audio file. About two weeks ago, I produced a video where I compared the bass response of four very different types of designs of loudspeakers. There was a sealed box, a ported design, one with a passive radiator, and these things behind me, the Celestion 300s, which are 28 years old and are a transmission line design. And it turned out that in terms of pure bass response, that the Celestions came out on top. So I thought it's time to post a kind of formal review of these speakers and ask myself a couple of fundamental questions. These speakers were a thousand pounds, 1200 pounds, I think in the walnut finish 28 years ago. And the equivalent model today, you'd argue would be about two, two and a half grand. Well, how does this compare with products around two, two and a half thousand pounds? And if you're buying it second hand for 300 pounds, 400 pounds maybe, what kind of value does it represent? If you're interested in finding out, that's what this video is about. Celestion is a company that has fallen off the map in recent years, in terms of domestic loudspeakers at least. But it was founded in 1924 and really came into prominence in the early 80s with models like the SL6 and its successor, the SL600. This came a little bit later, the 300s were launched in 1992. And at that time, Celestion was getting quite a lot of attention for metal dome tweeters. They weren't very common and it was one of the companies that kind of pioneered that type of technology. So let's take a look at this design. Well, let's start with the tweeter itself. It's a one and a quarter inch aluminium dome tweeter. And it was produced using something called laser interferometry. Now I had to look this up. This is essentially where they get two lasers to create an interference pattern so they could very precisely predict the radiation pattern of the tweeter. There was some other very cool innovative stuff that they did as well. The uh, voice coil was wound directly onto the dome and that was supposed to increase mechanical integrity. It had a very substantial neodymium magnet structure around it. And what they claimed at the time was that this tweeter had a pistonic kind of motion, which is what you want the driver to work perfectly as a piston without wobbling, uh, because that will create a distortion. So they claimed that this had this perfect kind of pistonic motion way above 20 kilohertz. The woofer is this six and a half inch long throw Cobex plastic cone in a die cast frame. It's quite a substantial structure as you can see from this photograph. Now Cobex is one of the materials again that you don't hear about today. From what I could find out it's essentially a form of PVC. What you'll typically see in terms of plastic cone materials today is polypropylene. The tweeter is mounted directly onto this zinc die cast frame and there's another frame that goes around the woofer. It has these slots across the front and essentially what that helps is with diffraction across the front baffle. So let's get on to the crossover. The crossover is a third order type. What that basically means is that at the crossover frequency, it rolls off at a slope of 18 dBs per octave. Now, if you look at the crossover itself, you'll see three of these black objects in there they are polycaps, polypropylene capacitors. They are the better type. That's what you want to see. The cheaper ones are electrolytic caps that you see in less expensive speakers, and they tend to dry out over time and have a less linear response. So nice to see the polycaps in there. Those two white rectangular objects that you see there are resistors, and they're the wire wound type that you typically see in the crossover of speakers at this price point and above for that matter. And these get a little bit of stick from DIY enthusiasts because they have a higher inductance than the metal film resistors that they ideally like to see. But I have it on the authority of more than one speaker designer that the inductance of the resistor is relatively low compared to the inductance of the voice coil. So replacing them doesn't make that much difference. Now, I have an open mind about this and I allow people to have a civil 
uh, discussion about it in the comments section and form their own opinions. That little red ring that you see there is an air core inductor and I'm pretty certain that that yellow plastic jacket is wrapped around an iron core inductor. Now ideally in a crossover network you want to see the air core inductor. They're the better type, they're more expensive but they don't saturate their magnetic fields as easily. Having said that, it's very likely that the air core inductor is in the signal path but the iron core inductor is not in the signal path. It's most likely to be some kind of notch filter. And that's pretty much as the name suggests. It's basically a little filter over a very short bandwidth that's used to smooth out the frequency response if there's an anomaly in the tweeter or the woofer somewhere. The last aspect of this design that I'd like to speak about is about the cabinet and the enclosure itself. That's what makes this speaker special in my eyes in terms of its bass response. This is a transmission line design. So if you look inside this cabinet, you'll see all this internal bracing. There's a huge amount of damping material in there as well. That does an excellent job in terms of reducing resonances in the cabinet and effectively making it inert. But it's there as the part of the transmission line design. And what that is essentially is an acoustic labyrinth. It's kind of a tunnel with folds and tapers and it takes the back energy of the woofer, channels it down there and essentially outputs it from the port for all intents and purposes at the other end. It's really complex to design and get right but if you get it right essentially what you're doing is taking the back energy from the woofer, very finely tuning it so that you get a much tighter, much more extended bass response than you would get from a ported design. Ported designs inherently have a problem with the output of the port remaining in phase with the output of the woofer. Now for all intents and purposes and simplicity's sake, let's just call this a timing issue. At the resonant frequency of the port, port's output is in phase, but the port is also producing frequencies slightly above and slightly below its resonant frequency. And at these frequencies, to some degree, greater or lesser, it's out of phase. This results in ported designs typically having a nice extension to the base, but a slightly flabby base because of this timing issue. Sealed box enclosures have their own problems as well. Sealed box doesn't have a port, so there's no phase problems from there, but it doesn't have the base extension as well. What it does have is a very tight and punchy base because you're using the back energy from the woofer to effectively act like a spring and move the woofer in and out very quickly. That's what we mean when we say it's got very good transient response. A transmission line done correctly now that's a big if done correctly because it's really complex to do, is essentially the best of both worlds. You're taking the back energy from the woofer, channeling it down the transmission line. It still has an excellent transient response. And essentially because you're sending it down that line, you're absorbing a lot of unwanted resonances and frequencies. You can finally tune the uh, output so it remains perfectly at phase at the desired frequency. Now that's normally the first quarter um, wave kind of point. So if you look at sine wave, it goes up, down, and up again. That first quarter point resonance, that's what you're trying to exploit with a transmission line design. So really complex to build, but done right, essentially could be the best of both worlds. Okay, so that's enough about the design of the speaker. Let's look at how the Celestion 300 sound. Let's compare it to something modern. Now, I don't have two, two and a half thousand pounds worth of floor standing speaker here at the moment. So I'm gonna compare it to the Buka S400s. And the reason I've chosen that is it's a current speaker. It's well known, well reviewed. So it's a good reference point. And also, because it's got that massive passive radiator at the back, it performs like a compact floor stander. So the Bucarts are about £1,700 here in the UK. This was £1,200 
28 years ago in 1992, arguably to two and a half grand today. Fair comparison. Let's start with the base. The Bucarts, in my room at least, go down to around 35 hertz. The Celestrions here dig a little bit deeper, maybe down to around 30 hertz. The Bucarts have good base weight, given their size, extremely good base weight. But as you'd expect from a bigger speaker, these have even more base weight. Now, this is where you'd expect a smaller speaker to come back. You'd expect the bass to be faster and tighter on the smaller speaker. And again, the Bucarts perform well in this category. They'll see off most speakers in terms of their bass weight within their price category, but they won't see off these speakers. These speakers are tighter and faster and weightier and more extended. In terms of bass response, I have hardly heard anything that can match these at anywhere near this price point. So in terms of base performance at least, the Celestions are the clear winner. So let's talk about the mid-range. Let's start with the lower mid-range. That's that 150 to 300 hertz region, which you associate with warm and kind of woody sounds. The Bucarts are very full and rich in this area. It's a fundamental characteristic of their sound. And the Celestions are a little bit more reserved in that characteristic. It's kind of a little bit leaner and drier in that area. So it's a personal taste which one you prefer. If you go through the frequency bands and we talk about mid-range in general, the Bucarts uh, produce uh, vo vocals extremely well. They soften slightly leading edges and the Celestions are a little bit more forward in this regard. Leading edges are a little bit more defined. But in terms of ultimate resolution, the Bucarts have, have it over the Celestrions. They're a little bit more resolving. You can pick up fine details in the sound more easily in the Bucarts than you can in the Celestrions. And the Bucarts also have a wider sound stage and they're also more precise in their imaging. You're able to place instruments within the sound stage more easily than you can on the Celestrions. Sometimes big speakers have a problem with the sound being tied to the speakers a little bit more and that's certainly the case. The Bucarts seem to be more free, for, the sound seems to be more free from the speakers than it does with the Celestions. The upper mid-range, I have criticisms of both speakers in this area. Um, the Celestions tend to be a little bit forward and a little bit aggressive with harsh recordings. You'll know about it with the Celestions. That metal dome tweeter shows itself back in the 90s. I don't think they've quite got it perfectly under control and tamed and it has a little bit of a bite and a little bit of an edge to it. Makes it lively and engaging with good recordings, but with slightly bright, aggressive recordings, it can get a little too much. The Bucarts are a little bit dark in that area. They're, they're, they're kind of quite reserved and, and, and hold back in that kind of 2,500 to 5,000 hertz range. Pro apps that I have, I think are spot on right in the middle in that particular uh, upper mid-range. High frequencies are more extended on the Celestions. You get a bit more feeling of space and air. They're a little bit more rolled off in the Bucart. That was design characteristic that they built in to make it a bit more forgiving of edgier recordings and also uh, a little bit uh, more forgiving in terms of room placement. So overall, I would say the Bucarts have better resolution and detail. Um, but are essentially a little bit darker in tonal presentation. These are dynamic, punchy, a little bit more lively and slightly more aggressive and perhaps not quite as resolving as the Bucarts are. They certainly are comparable in terms of quality. Um, there's pluses and minuses to each speaker depending on which one you like. In terms of speaker positioning, this speaker, like most speakers, benefits from being away from walls. I find the only speakers that work well close to walls are those that are specifically designed to work in that scenario. So typically a meter or so away from walls is ideal. But these speakers, even though they produce a lot of bass, they have very tight bass and you can put them closer to the wall than you would ordinarily expect a speaker of this size that produces this much bass 
to do. So as you move the speaker closer to the wall, of course the bass is gonna get a little flabbier and you're gonna get more bass in the room and you could potentially overload small rooms with the amount of bass energy that you have. But you, they're a little bit more flexible um, than perhaps a typical floor stander with a ported design around this size. Partnering equipment, over the years I've used these with a bunch of amplifiers. They normally run with my Technics Dual Mono, that's in for service at the moment, but uh, that's what I normally run them with. That's got 120 watts, two big power transformers. It's a dual mono design. It has the power and the grip to really get hold of these woofers and get the most out of the bass response. But I've run them with a 200 pound Marantz amplifier. They're an eight ohm load. I haven't got the impedance plot from 30 odd years ago, but I don't expect there to be any unusual dips that put a huge amount of demand on your amplifier because I've run them with pretty much entry level amplifiers and they're fine. Of course, you don't get the same level of authority and grip and control of the woofer that you get with more expensive amplifiers, but they're, they're you know, they, it's manageable. I've run them with five, 600 pounds worth of RCAM amplifier, 60, 70 watts per channel, and that worked particularly well as well. Not as good as the Technics, that's more powerful. So they benefit from having bigger, more powerful amplifiers to keep control of that bottom end and get the most out of them, but they don't represent any particularly demanding load for amplifiers. They're 84 dBs in terms of sensitivity. Now that's a low sensitivity design. They've gone for bass extension here rather than sensitivity. As a speaker designer, you're normally trading one for the other. So if you listen in a large room or you like to listen loud, you're going to need watts. And in any case, this is a speaker that benefits from having a bit of muscle and a bit of power out of there because the key defining speak, uh, characteristic of this speaker is its bass performance. And to get the most out of that bass performance, you need a little bit of power and a little bit of control, as I spoke about earlier. Okay, so let's wrap things up. If these speakers were selling today for say two, two and a half thousand pounds, how would they compete with modern day rivals? Well, I can judge that based on the comparison I've done in this review with the Bucar S400s and other speakers I have here that I've kept out of this review for simplicity's sake. And I have to say in terms of pure detail and refinement and resolution, they don't quite compete with the best speakers at that price point. They're not miles away, but they're not quite there. Things have progressed a little bit in the last 30 years. There are aspects of its performance that are extremely competitive, even by today's standards, especially its bass response. I have yet to hear a speaker in my room at around its price point, um, say two, two and a half K, for, adjusting it for today's figures that has the speed, the clarity and the weight of bass that these speakers have. This is a speaker that's a lot of fun to listen to because of that excellent bass response. It has a slightly forward uh, mid range, which just gives it a lot of engagement um, and a nicely extended treble. They're not perfect, no speaker is, but they're still extremely enjoyable speakers to listen to. And you're not going to be buying these speakers for two, two and a half thousand pounds. If you're buying them second hand, they're likely to be three, four hundred pounds. Now, as long as you're careful what you buy and who you buy from and where you buy from, I think they represent excellent value. I'd like to think, um, I'd like to see what you guys think and perhaps you can share in the comment section. So if you like this video, please hit that like button. Um, please share it. And if you haven't subscribed, please consider subscribing. But for today, for now, a British audiophile signing off.